Today's scripture has to do with fulfilling scripture. Now I'd like to start this off with asking a question. If you have the chance to go back in time at any point, any point in history, where would you choose? If you could choose the exact day, what day in history would you choose? I know there's so many to choose from, but I'm going to speak of the day in which I would like to go back to. According to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus went back home to Nazareth where he grew up. And just like a college student returning home, he went to church on Sunday, or more accurately, to synagogue on the Sabbath. Now the people there were glad to see him. They even made him liturgist for the day asking him to read the scripture lesson and then to do what we don't ask our liturgists to do here, to comment on the scripture. It was the kind of thing that at that time an adult member of a synagogue was permitted to do. Jesus was handed the scroll of Isaiah and he turned the scrolls in his hand winding from one side and unwinding with the other until he found the assigned reading for the day in which our Bible tells us it was Isaiah 61 verse 1 and 2. And that verse read is this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover the sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He read that piece standing up, as was a custom, and then handed the scroll back to the attendant. And he sat down to speak which was also the custom at that time. He then proceeded to give a very, very brief sermon, briefer than anyone attending the church can ever hope to hear. From that pulpit, the current administration could not believe how short the sermon was, but the words would ring on until eternity. What he said was this. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now in all three of the synoptics gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell about his visit to Nazareth and his hometown synagogue. And all three agree that it did not go well at all. Particularly because the hometown folks they were impressed all right at first for a carpenter or one who was good with his hands. He spoke very well, but mostly they seemed to resent him, wondering how this man had grown up in their community, whose family was still there, could have attained such wisdom and insight. All three of these gospels tell the same story. But Luke tells it more fully, adding his own unique details. First of all, he marks this day, making it the first recorded act and ministry of Jesus, sort of his inaugural sermon. Now this is coming right after his baptism with John and also after his temptation in the wilderness. So what Jesus has to say here becomes a mission statement, a blueprint of what he will do for the next three years. 
And second, where Mark and Matthew only say Jesus spoke, Luke offers some content. He tells us what the scripture reading was and what Jesus said after reading the text. So that in Luke, these words that Jesus read that day in his hometown synagogue from the prophet Isaiah, it set the agenda and the tone for what he will be doing for the next few years of his life. They summarize what Jesus was all about. He was all about bringing good news to the poor, proclaiming a release to captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He was all about letting the oppressed go free and all about proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee. When property gets turned to people who have lost it, when debts are forgiven, and people are restored. During the year of Jubilee, set at every seven years and every 50 years, no business can go as usual. Slaves must be given their freedom. Families can return to lands lost in litigation. Farmlands and field get a Sabbath of rest, for there is no planning on harvesting. They are all canceled. The Jubilee year is to be a foretaste and celebration of the kingdom of heaven. Liberation, restoration, health restored, jails unlocked, lands returned, a whole array of social justice revolutions. Now, as you may notice, there isn't one word in Jesus' inauguration or his inaugural address about anything but social justice issues. There is no talk about sanctity of private property, the glory of free market, nor the duty to pray three times a day, or to avoid eating ham or lobster tails. Nothing about swift and certain hanging for capital crimes. Nothing that you might expect from a religious leader. All Jesus spoke was is about how society is to be changed, how there is to be a kinder, gentler society. Good news for the poor, release to the captives, sight to the blind, freedom from the oppressed, and the year of Jubilee. And then Jesus says, according to Luke, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's the day I would have wished I would have been there to witness those prolific words. Well, as you can expect, it was just a little too much for our humble parishioners of the temple of Israel and Nazareth. They had never heard anyone say anything like that before let alone someone who had grown up right in front of their eyes. For today is enough to think about these words and what they mean. And how did Jesus fulfill these anxious words of the prophet Isaiah? And even more importantly, as Jesus' people, how are we to fulfill these words of Isaiah? Or how are we to fulfill the words of Jesus? Because if it is true that these words were a clarion call for Jesus, a summary of his mission to come, then are they also our mission as being his children? We might well ask, what is the good news for the poor today? Is there any? Is there good news for the unemployed? People have been out of work for so long that they no longer even show up on the statistics. With unemployment rates over the last five to seven years at record highs, and the number of records of home foreclosures, with people struggling to make ends meet on a day-to-day -day basis for themselves, their children, 
and their loved ones. But Jesus has made a way for these things. There is good news for all of us. But what about the most vulnerable in our society? Is there good news for them? One thing that I do have to say that pertains to all of us, pertaining to today, history will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period of social transition was not the strident clamor of the bad people that we hear so much about, but about the appalling silence of the good people. As long as we stay silent, others will not. I realize that we are not part of a crackdown rescue team, of course, but we too have the opportunity to make a difference in one, two, or more lives. I started to think about the idea of fulfilling scripture. Jesus, according to Luke, claimed to be fulfilling the words of Isaiah. I began to wonder if we might fulfill words of scripture in our own way. This text from Isaiah that became part of Jesus' agenda, the words that Jesus claimed to fulfill this day, should they be part of our agenda also? Part of our own marching orders from a day-to-day -day basis. I had recently had the opportunity to recall a poem written by Howard Thurman, a minister, education, educa educator, and former civil rights leader. The poem is called The Work of Christmas. It goes like this. When the song of the angels is still, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoners, to rebuild the nation, to bring peace among brothers, to make music in the heart of men and women throughout the world. Now this is not Isaiah, but it's very close. And I think I can say that Howard Thurman fulfilled not only his thoughts on this, but the words of Isaiah. Today these words are fulfilled in your hearing. So what scriptures might you and I fulfill today? Well, I can start with those same words of Isaiah to see our job bringing good news to the poor, release to the captives, sight to the blind, freedom to the oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptance year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee, which says something about how we regard our possessions. Today, is there some word of scripture that I can fulfill, at least partially? Could I at least fulfill partially the greatest of all commandments found in both the Hebrew scriptures and in our own? To love God with all my heart and soul and mind and strength. At least partially, can we all as Christians fulfill this? Or maybe to love my neighbor as myself. Can we love each other as one another, as ourselves? Do we dare fulfill that scripture? Maybe somebody will curse me today, and I will have an opportunity to do what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, that we should do in that situation, bless those that curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. Or perhaps in some way, I can bring good news to someone who needs it. And maybe, just maybe at the end of the day, I can say to myself, and we can all say, 
that today this scripture has been fulfilled.